Having lingered over Giotto and the Proto-Renaissance, I'm going to race through early Renaissance architecture. The Khan Academy podcasts describe our two required works very well, and I'm not going to repeat those points. Instead, I'm going to show you other works by the same architects and talk more generally about Italian Renaissance architecture. So don't skip those podcasts, okay? Here, with some modern additions, of course, is the skyline of the early Italian Renaissance. On the right, circled in green, you see Florence Cathedral, which is an Italian Gothic structure with a campanile, or bell tower, that was designed by Giotto. I've circled that in blue. And, of course, Brunelleschi's famous Renaissance dome. Further to your left, circled in red, is the tower of the Palazzo della Signoria, the House of the Lords, or the Town Hall. Although they are now in museums, Donatello's David, Michelangelo's David, and Donatello's Judith all at some point stood in the piazza or square in front of this building, symbolizing Florence's fight against its more powerful neighbors. So here's a closer look at the Palazzo Vecchio, which is how the Palazzo della Signoria is now known. It's basically a fortified building, and that was for protection against Florence's own citizens. There was a big workers' uprising in Florence in the 14th century and many internal struggles afterwards. At this point in our history, Florence was a republic run by merchant oligarchs and increasingly, as we saw, by the Medici family. Note that Siena had a very similar town hall. That's where you can still find Lorenzetti's parable of good and bad government. You'll recall, I hope, that Brunelleschi lost the famous competition to sculpt and cast the baptistry doors. That project would keep Ghiberti busy for 20 years, but Brunelleschi, after he sulked for a while, went off to Rome to study Roman buildings. Upon his return, he began to design classically inspired buildings, such as our required work, the Pazzi Chapel, which you see on the bottom, and on the top, this hospital, really an orphanage for abandoned children. That the city commissioned such a work and wanted it to be beautiful really says something to me about the importance of Florentine civic culture. So this chapel is a required work, and it was donated by the wealthy Pazzi family to the Franciscan Church of Santa Croce in Florence. It originally served as the chapter house or meeting room for the Franciscan friars. Again, we see the geometrical elements, semicircles, cubes, and rectangles. Uh, here, by the way, the cornices are used on the inside of the building. And here's a closer view of the roundels or tondos. Uh, one is the French term, one is the Italian. Note the four evangelists in the pendentives, and by now you should recognize their symbols. And below the cornice, the apostles. Which one is this one? Did you catch the keys? It's almost certainly St. Peter. Luca della Robbia sculpted the apostles, uh, excuse me, uh, but the evangelists have been attributed to della Robbia, to Brunelleschi himself, even to Donatello. I hunted around, but I couldn't get a definitive word on that. The Pazzi Chapel was designed on the simple central plan that Brunelleschi so admired in the Pantheon. So here you see Brunelleschi's plan with the logia that was later added by another architect to his plan. But a logia is a typical feature of Renaissance architecture. Again, notice how the design employs the gray Pietra Serena stone to set off the walls and to highlight the building's geometric regularity. We also see an oculus in the dome, another shout out to the Pantheon. By the way, art historians now think that Brunelleschi drew up the initial plan, but died before the building's execution and detailing, and he did not design the second floor. Okay, I really do have to show you Brunelleschi's famous dome. Note that it employs pointed ogival arches, an Islamic and Gothic innovation. The Pantheon had a lower hemispherical dome, but the Roman architects used concrete and they made the walls extraordinarily thick to support the dome. Brunelleschi needed to go higher. He needed to build without scaffolding. Remember, there wasn't enough wood. And the design of the rest of the cathedral demanded lighter, airier walls. His solution, including a dome within a dome, was both artistically and scientifically innovative, one of the great symbols of the Renaissance synthesis between science and art, classicism and innovation, but not, amazingly enough, a required work. 
So here's another Brunelleschi uh, design. It's the interior of Santo Spirito. What Brunelleschi features do you recognize? Well, again, you should have noted the rhythmic simplicity, the use of arches and Corinthian columns, the contrast between plaster and Pietra Serena, and the use of roundels as a decorative uh, accent. In this and other buildings that he designed, Brunelleschi employed a geometric modular pattern. The nave, for example, is exactly twice as high as it is wide. This extreme geometric regularity made his buildings both highly rhythmic and serene, and both of these are trademarks of Renaissance architecture. Renaissance Florentine architects also specialized in residential architecture, which really isn't a surprise when you consider that their patrons were mostly wealthy merchants who enjoyed living well. So what classical elements do you perceive? And the photo on the right should be a pretty broad hint. Alberti deliberately echoed the ascending orders of the Colosseum. So we see Tuscan on the bottom. That's a form of Doric with a base uh, and doesn't have flutes, followed by Ionic, and then Corinthian in the place of rounded columns, however, he used, what's the term? Pilasters, or flat engaged columns, in this case, completely flat with the surface. Uh, you should also note the arch-topped windows and the massive cornice. The effect is so screen-like grid, highly controlled, mathematical, proportional. Alberti, by the way, not only designed buildings, he wrote books about painting, sculpture, and architecture. And in fact, he's one of our best guides to the art of the Renaissance. But I should note that some art historians challenge the attribution to Alberti. The College Board apparently does not. I could imagine this work showing up on the AP exam, asking you to identify its era, its art historical period, and it's clearly a Renaissance palace. You'll note the similarities to the palazzo you just saw. Cosimo de' Medici wanted elegance without ostentation. He was all about operating behind the scenes and keeping a low profile, but the building also reflects his interest in the classical. Note the rusticated or rough edge brick, which was a common Roman feature. The internal courtyard looks a lot like Brunelleschi's interior, simple, geometric, and organized around the arch. I'm including this non-required work because it's considered to be Alberti's masterpiece and because I can imagine you being asked to identify its classical features. So what are these? Well, essentially, and maybe a little oddly, Alberti married a Roman imperial arch to a Greek temple. You see the triangular pediment on top surrounded by the typically massive Renaissance cornice. The ugly tunnel-like feature on the top was added later, do not blame Alberti. Inside, Alberti employed coffered ceilings, remember the Pantheon, and the Roman barrel vault. On to early Renaissance sculpture and painting. 